morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. I'm delighted to see you all here this morning. Equally delighted to have you joining us online. Those of you that are with us that way today would like to say a special word of welcome to visitors in both places. We're very glad that you are here and hope that you find this time of worship to be meaningful to you. Would like to announce this morning that the uh, nominating committee that's going to meet after worship today uh, will not be meeting in room 122. They're going to be meeting in the fireside room uh, today. So if you're on the nominating committee, please go to the fireside room uh, for that meeting. Also, today is another uh, special Franck Sunday in the life of our church where you have an opportunity to hear a beautiful uh, extended postlude today. We're going to need a slight break to change over CDs in between worship and when that will begin. So there'll be a brief pause uh, between the benediction and when the postlude uh, will begin. But you're invited to, if you'd like to and can, to stay uh, and enjoy that musical piece. And Puffer is going to say a, another little word about that and do it more justice. This. Good morning. So just a reminder about César Franck was a French composer who was born 200 years ago and he wrote music for all kinds of instruments but was particularly interested in the organ and was very influential in the development of the, of the grand symphonic organ like we have here. Um, before that organs were kind of small and not so impressive but thanks to Franck and some other po folks from France in the 1800s we have these really big organs and today we hear a piece that really matches the big organ. This is the first piece ever um, for organ to use the title symphony um, it's a really grand piece, and you hear Franck experimenting with all the possible colors of the organ, trying to make the organ sound as much as possible like a full orchestra. So you'll hear parts where the organ sounds like uh, the timpani or sounds like uh, the trumpets and, and trombones, uh, lots of ranges of color. It's in three large-scale movements, um, and the middle movement uh, is itself in several kind of smaller sections. Um, so it's a grand piece. Uh, the, it's in the, the, uh, the actual title is called gr or Big or Grand Symphonic Piece. Um, it's about 30 minutes long, uh, but it's 30 minutes of really wonderful music, so we encourage you to stick around and enjoy this great piece. As a reminder, Franck, uh, whose 200th birthday we're celebrating, he wrote 12 major pieces for organ, and John Edward our fabulous organist is playing one of each of those 12 pieces each month. Uh, so we're a little more than halfway through this year, but lots of great music to come. Thank you, Puffer. We'd now like to ask Richard Riggs to come forward. Uh, next Sunday is a special day in the life of our church. We'll have our rally day. Good morning. On behalf of the Nurture Committee, I'd like to invite all of you to join us next Sunday for our annual rally day. Um, I've all of a sudden lost my notes. Um, well, I'll ad lib. Uh, the uh, Rally Day is our annual event where we uh, provide information on all that's going on at First Presbyterian Church. It'll be held next Sunday uh, during the Sunday school hour at 9.30 in Watchorn Hall. Breakfast will be provided free of charge, uh, no cost, no obligation, but you just might have an opportunity to to hear of, uh, you might hear of an opportunity to further participate in the life of the church. And if nothing else, you'll have a great opportunity for fellowship with other First Presbyterian Church members. So please join us next Sunday at 930 in Watchhorn Hall. All right. Thank you, Richard. Again, this is much more than just about the Sunday school classes that are offered, but other ways to plug into the life of the church. So we hope we will see you next Sunday morning. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Please rise now in body or spirit as we call ourselves to worship. 
The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. Let us worship God. Please join me now in the prayer of the day. Holy God, you sent your Son to be baptized among sinners, to seek and save the lost. May we, who have been baptized in his name, never turn away from the world, but reach out in love to rescue the wayward. By the mercy of Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We know that nothing is able to separate us from the love of God and Jesus Christ. Let us in freedom confess the wrong we have done. Eternal God, our judge and redeemer, we confess that we have tried to hide from you, for we have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves and apart from you. We have turned from our neighbors and refused to bear the burdens of others. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. In your great mercy, forgive our sins and free us from selfishness, that we may choose your will through Jesus Christ our Savior.
Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. To this peace we are called as members of a single body. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. disciples walk Are you walking? Yeah, very nice large group today come on over here Amelia I'm not gonna bite you <clears throat> All right. So today was our last day of our monumental Bible School Sunday School. We had fun, didn't we? Yes? A little more enthusiasm? <laughs> <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> um, so, and we, we really learned a lot. Didn't we learn a lot? We learned that God is awesome thank you Ruby and that that he um, <clears throat> what was the first one <laughs> and that he goes with us everywhere no matter what he he will still love us he has a purpose of, of, and he ha he's stronger than anything and today we found out that he's surprising right we had a puppet show we also found out the end of the story about Joseph and his brothers that was pretty good right was it a thumbs up if you thought it was a happy ending? Thumbs down if you thought it was a sad ending. He was happy, right? He was happy because he, he got together with his brothers. So it was a really big surprise that he got together with his brothers. And the biggest surprise of all was that one of Miss Cindy's experiments actually worked. Didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, we, we took cabbage juice that really smelled and we poured it in all different kinds of liquids and it turned colors. It was really exciting. I was equally as surprised as they were <laughs> that it worked. So, on to the next event, which will be next week. We'll see you all back here again for Rally Day. And then we're going to do something special at, during our Bible school time. We're going to do sand art. And we're going to plant a cactus on top of it. So that should be fun. All right, so with that in mind, <laughs> let's say a prayer. Heavenly Father, you are awesome. Thank you for showing us your great love these past weeks. Amen. All right.
Now we're going to say the Lord's Prayer. Can, who can say the Lord's Prayer? You can say it. You ready? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good job, Ellie. Okay, walk over to the door. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Thank you. Talk about bringing the spirit into your soul. That, that will do it for me. It did it for me this morning. 
The scripture reading today is from Jeremiah, chapter 2, verses 4 through 13, found on page 699 in your pew Bible. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What wrong did your ancestors find in me that they went far from me and went after worthless things and became worthless themselves? They did not say, Where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness, in a land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that no one passes through where no one lives. I brought you into a plentiful land to eat its fruits and its good things. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me The rules transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Therefore, once more, I accuse you, says the Lord, and I accuse your children's children. Cross to the coast of Cyprus and look. Send to Kedar and examine with care. See if there has ever been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods even though there are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for something that does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, says the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and dug out cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns, that can hold no water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. place at the table for everyone born clean water and bread a shelter a space a safe place for growing for everyone born a star overhead and God will delight when we are created of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy. For woman and man, A place at the table, revising the roles, deciding the share, with wisdom and grace, dividing the power, for woman and man, a system that's fair. For young and for old, a place at the table, a voice to be heard, a part in the song. The hands of a child in hands that are wrinkled, for young and for old, a new right to belong. And God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion. 
compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy. For everyone born a place at the table to live without fear and simply to be to work to speak out to witness and worship for everyone born a right to be free and god will delight when we are created of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy. Unexpected emotion this morning. I know that shocks you all. <clears throat> but Puffers, amazing how a song can take you back to a time and a place. And that song will forever take me to a place that I wish I could snap my fingers and transport us all to. And it's a place called Anderson Auditorium in Montreat, North Carolina. And that is a wonderful song made even better uh, when you're singing it surrounded by a thousand or more uh, high schoolers. Um, thank you, Puffer. For that. Let's just go have lunch. No, just. But before we do, uh, let's look at the Gospel of Luke from chapter 14. I'll be reading the first and then seventh through 14th verses. It can be found on page 77 in your pew Bible. On, the, on one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by the host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to one who had invited them, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This scripture takes me back to, takes me back to a rite of passage in the South. I don't know if y'all do it around here, probably. It's called cotillion. In the South, the term typically refers to etiquette classes for the elementary or middle school kids. Most combine dancing and other matters of etiquette. I wore the uh, cotillion uniform, which in the 1980s in North Carolina was duck head khaki pants, a button down Oxford shirt, a tie, and a navy blue blazer. Anybody have that outfit in their closet? We learn early on and teach our children 
to say a blessing before we eat, that it isn't polite to chew with your mouth open, and to not begin eating until everyone is served. We learn to use eating utensils starting from the outside and moving inward through each course, to place our knife and fork on our plates as an indication that we are finished, and to not refold our napkin. Proper etiquette is important to many people. I remember cotillion days when I read this scripture, and, and I also think about place cards. Have you ever been to dinners where you were assigned a seat? I have occasionally had to talk a bride down from the edge when she was becoming undone trying not to offend family and friends in the seating chart. I also remember occasional dinners at the governor's mansion in Raleigh, North Carolina during Governor Hunt's terms of service when I was growing up. My father was his pastor and his friend. It was always fun to find our table and see my name on a place card. I knew where my dad would be. His card would be on the head table. There is not a humbler person on earth than my father was. But I remember as a little boy feeling a swell of pride inside my chest, seeing my dad seated right next to the governor at his right hand. I wonder who arrived at the dinner on the occasion in our New Testament lesson, hoping to sit at the right hand of the Pharisee. Jesus is at a dinner in the home of the leader of the Pharisees. Jesus, you recall, is on his way to Jerusalem at this point in the crucifixion that awaited him there. Two things have begun to happen since Jesus begun this journey five chapters ago. The crowds have changed. The crowds who had followed Jesus with such enthusiasm earlier in the gospel had begun to thin out as Jesus made the meaning of discipleship more clear, the crowds are shrinking. But as the crowds are shrinking, the conflict is growing. That's the second thing. Along the way of the journey has been this growing conflict with the scribes and the Pharisees as Jesus challenges their teaching, challenges their interpretation of the law, Jesus' list of offenses is growing in Luke's gospel. He's been criticized for blasphemy, for he forgave sins. He's been accused of being unclean, excuse me, because he ate and drank with sinners and was touched by them. Finally, he broke Sabbath law. His disciples picked grain from a field, and he had healed people. So when Jesus came to the table at the home of the leader of the Pharisees, the atmosphere is charged. Confrontation is on the menu. Verse 1 sets this tone. They were watching him closely. They were watching him to catch him. Catch him in some other error of doctrine or practice. Some further violation of the law. They were waiting for that one thing they could use to finally get him, to finally discredit him. Well, Jesus would not disappoint. They did not have to wait long. At the beginning of the meal in verse 2, even before the host could welcome his guests, Jesus heals a man with dropsy. He's done it again. He broke the big one. It's unlawful to heal on the Sabbath. Jesus heals the man and asks the lawyers and the Pharisee a question, the question that leaves them speechless. Verse 6 says, And they could not reply to this. Unable for them to reply, Jesus does not back off. He keeps pushing them by noticing the way that his guests seated themselves at the table. He tells the guests a parable about table manners in the kingdom of God. In the ancient Near East, there were certain important, um, excuse me, important customs that governed behavior at meals. It was important to wash your guests' feet prior to the meal. It was important to seat people in the proper social order. 
Usually tables at that time were in the shape of a U with the host seated in the middle of the head table and the other seated by importance to the host left and right, going down from most important to least. The closer you were to the host, the more honored the guest. And hosts were not bashful in these days. They didn't worry much about people's feelings. By the end of the meal, it was very clear where you were, by where you were seated, where you actually stood. If the more honored a guest arrived, the host would not hesitate to simply ask you to move down and seat the honored guests more closely to themselves. So Jesus notices this behavior of those people at the dinner trying to claw over each other to get to the closest places of honor. Jesus tells them to choose instead the lowest place so that in turn they might be honored. Jesus most often used daily experiences to teach spiritual lessons. In this instance, Jesus turns things upside down again that those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is another way of, that we call divine reversals that accompany the kingdom of God, things that challenge the ways of the world. Jesus ends the narrative with instructions to the host. Instead of, thanks for a wonderful dinner, I had a great time. He said, man, you got the guest list all wrong. You don't just invite people who can return the favor, people that can add to your status because they can in turn include you at their party. No. What you need to do, you need to go out and get the people that can't help you one bit. Bring in the poor, bring in the cripple, bring in the lame and the blind, bring in the helpless ones whom the economy of the kingdom of God is good news. Indeed, thinking today about taking the lowest place carries with it a certain risk. Those who already are humble, already in that place, might hear this as a demand to empty themselves more, more than they already have. But of course, on the other hand, some may hear this passage as a formula for their own advancement. They may position themselves to compete with others in a race for the lowest place, hoping to win the prize awarded to the humblest of all. Jesus gives us an ethical admonition to underestimate ourselves rather than overestimate. That can be potent medicine for those too impressed by their own accomplishments. We struggle to find the right seat at the table. And that's the whole point. It's not about us finding our place at the table. It's about us letting go and allowing God to seat us where God will. God's point of view matters so much more than our own and more than those who are, are in a position to turn the spotlight on us or away from us in this world. The guests sought to choose their place and to seek honor. We are free from the anxiety of wondering where to sit. We do not have to choose our place because we have already been chosen. We don't need to worry with such things as seeking honor in this world. We have all been chosen, honored above all earthly honors, by being claimed by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. As members of the same family, we share equally in that spiritual inheritance. There is no hierarchy in heaven. We dine, all of us, at a round table, all equal in the presence of our Creator. Our lifestyles may vary greatly on this earth, but we share equally in our salvation, in our redemption to live powerful, meaningful lives in the present, and in our eternal inheritance. 
There are no first-class citizens set apart in God's kingdom on earth or in heaven. Your chosen place is to let God choose for you. Let God show you where you belong in this world. We are all simply pilgrim people who do the very best we can to live in right relationship with one another, in right relationship with God. May God help us in our human frailty not to lose our humility and our satisfaction when we think we have finally achieved it. To a world that seeks privilege, Jesus could care less if you came here today in a Bentley or on a city bus. That's not important. Jesus speaks of the importance of servanthood. Jesus speaks of bearing one another's burdens, standing with and for one another along life's pilgrimage. And all of us can do that. Standing with and for another along life's pilgrimage in Christian love might just be the most important thing that Jesus is trying to teach us. May God help us be authentic in our faith and truly to love kindness, to do justice, and to walk humbly with our God. Amen. Please stand if you are comfortable doing so and join me in reading the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
seated. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come before you in the stillness of this moment. We thank you that you are a God that hears our prayers. So let us open our hearts now to you so that prayers that go unspoken but are offered now might be heard. Lord, we pray for all those in our community and in our church who are struggling with COVID right now. We pray that they might experience your healing, if that be your will. And we pray that they experience your presence uh, during this time of illness. We pray for their families, some separated due to quarantine, that they might feel your peace and your presence during a time of anxiety and and heartache. Lord, we pray for those who struggle to meet the daily needs of life. We ask that we work to provide the basics of food, clothing, and shelter to all your children in our community and in our country, and ultimately in our world. Lord, we pray for your wisdom to overtake hard hearts within our world so that leaders of countries might allow their people freedom and justice so that all your creatures might be able to live the lives that you would have them live. Lord, we pray for the myriad of problems that each bring to this place. And so we ask now that your peace descend upon us, that your Holy Spirit lead us in the midst of our thoughts and in the midst of our decisions so that we might keep our lives on the path that you would have it go. In Christ's name we pray. The church has different ways to receive your pledges, tithes, and offerings. If you are worshiping with us in the sanctuary, offering plates are located by the doors as you exit the sanctuary. Please drop your offering in the plate. If you are worshiping with us from home today, you can support us through Venmo. Search for FPCOKC through the website. Click the Give button on the home page, or you can mail your contributions to the church. Thank you for your support of the ministry of First Presbyterian. Now let us return to God the offerings of our life and gifts of the earth. Give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let us worship God with our pledges, tithes, and offerings.
Let us pray. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, go now in peace, knowing that in the goodness of God you were born. And in God's mercy you've been held all the days of your life. And as a sign of God's eternal grace, your life has been redeemed for a purpose. So I charge you to go out from this place and continue living in the midst of God's purpose for your life. And as you do, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make the light of his countenance to shine upon you and grant you peace this day and forevermore. Amen. I know you. I hope you have.